This lecture was given to the C.G. Jung Society of Atlanta. Um, what I'm going to be doing tonight is uh, sort of bridging two worlds, if you will. One is um, the world of the inner world of the psyche. Um, and as we come to know it through the clinical work with dreams and imaginal products of the psyche, particularly as we come to know it in people who have suffered uh, severe early trauma. And I'm also going to be uh, bridging that world, which is really um, kind of complex and difficult for a lot of people because it's, it's called the inner object world. Um, Jung was one of our first real experts in explicating the dramatis personae of the inner world. I'm going to be bridging the, the figures in the inner world that I've found in work with people with early trauma with a fairy tale Rapunzel. And uh, I'm hoping that you know the fairy tale Rapunzel, sort of at least. And if you don't, uh, I'll be summarizing it as we go so that you can follow it. Reflecting in, in, on, on his years of practice, Jung commented in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, he made the following remarks. In many cases in psychiatry, the patient who comes to us has a story that is not told and which, as a rule, no one knows of. To my mind, therapy only really begins after the investigation of that wholly personal story. It is the patient's secret, the rock against which he is shattered. Now, in this evocative image of a shattering against the rock of some overwhelming experience, we have a, a serviceable beginning definition of trauma. When we call something traumatic, we're referring to some acute or cumulative experience which has been unbearable. And when we say it's unbearable, what we mean is that it cannot be contained within the psyche of the person who's experiencing it. It cannot be metabolized. Another way of talking about this is that it cannot be symbolized by the psyche's normal symbolic capacities. Trauma is always about a shattering, a breaking, or a severe rupture, a kind of splitting. Lower down on the trauma spectrum, there's a whole range of ordinarily upsetting experiences where the personality might be wounded or some part of the whole self might even be split off or repressed, as Jung suggested, in the form of a neurotic complex. But the personality is not shattered. If the trauma is not too severe, usually the very process about, of telling about the event will help heal it. The psyche naturally works and reworks injurious experience through the mystery of the symbolic process, what Jung called the transcendent function. This includes dreams and the symbolic play of children and all other bridging functions that the symbol plays in making what's unintelligible in the psyche meaningful and intelligible. If you remember, the archetype itself in Jung's understanding has one pole or root in the body and an affect, which is diffuse and undifferentiated, and one pole in the mind, in the image, which is differentiated. So archetypes are affect images, and as symbols they bridge the, the undifferentiated, unknown world of the, of the body and the psyche to the mind. So symbols then are generators of meaning. When, they're, when the symbolic function is operating properly. <clears throat> now, what Jung did not say in his comment about, about these shattering experiences, because it was poorly understood until more recently, is that some people cannot remember the shattering personal story at all. They can't remember the rock against which they were shattered because it's a secret even from, them, from themselves. And this is because a lot of unbearable experience happens to us when we are very young, when the ego is immature, and this is especially true in abusive environments. And if trauma occurs before language, uh, then there's a deep dissociation in the psyche that often leaves only a blank place, or perhaps a generalized depression, or a tragic lack of creative energy, or a sense of not being fully alive. Preverbal experience of this kind tends to be encoded in the body, 
in iconic or relational form, and it's not accessible as verbal memory. It's, it's not coded yet in narrative memory. One of the problems that we face for this reason is that we often don't really know what really happened to the child uh, because the child can't tell us. Um, I remember I was sitting with one patient uh, who had a, a horrendous early trauma history and uh, she could never relax in the session unless we did a lot of active imagination and, and just general uh, sort of development of the rapport between us and then every once in a while when she was able to relax and the tension in her body would sort of release, she would suddenly hear a screen door slamming. This broke into the session. That's all she heard. And this would happen to her in other places in her life and it made her feel crazy. So as we worked slowly um, over the course of probably six months, uh, a memory came back. First, we had only the sound of the screen door slamming. As I asked her to relax and meditate on this sound and breathe into it and just tell me whatever came to her, she suddenly um, had another sensation. It was actually a smell. The smell was of the kitchen. Slowly we pieced together what had happened. When she was two and a half, they lived in a trailer park in northern Maine, and her mother was having an affair with the man in the adjoining trailer park, threw her out of the trailer in her snowsuit in a cold February day and slammed the screen door. She wandered the park, trying to get into other places. She was lost. Uh, the mother threatened her if she told what was happening. And this was completely unavailable to her. So that's what happens to the, um, the nature of experience when it's dismembered by severe psychological defenses. I'll be talking tonight about the nature of these defenses. One of the things that we now know in our work here is that whole experience, the kind of experience that we carry around with us and talk about, is a combination of, of uh, a, a number of things. First of all, affect. An affect is usually in the body. Sensation, like that screen door slamming. Uh, knowledge of what is going on, the context. And some behavioral component. It's called the Basque model, behavior, affect, sensation, and knowledge. And what tends to happen when early trauma strikes the child is that the wholeness of experience is fragmented. And I'm going to talk about how that happens and what we now know about how that happens. So imagine a very small child, say a little girl of two and a half or three years, reaching out in love towards a parental figure, say her father. Let's imagine that this happens when the alcoholic father is drunk and that he's stimulated by his little girl's gestures of physical affection and then turns this moment into a sexual one. Exploiting his little girl's affection, telling her to stop crying, perhaps slapping her out of frustration as she cries unconsolably, and then threatening her with abandonment or worse if she tells mommy. Suddenly this child's innocent reaching out in need and longing has led to horrifying pain and disillusionment with the very figure whom she depends upon. D.W. Winnicott, a British object relations theorist, emphasizes that anxieties that are experienced at moments like this by children are unthinkable. Because they occur at such a vulnerable holding phase where the infant or young child is in total dependent merger with the parental figure and totally dependent upon that figure for its very existence as a self. He refers to the process that happens in normal childhood in an interesting way. He says the mother of a normal child is always introducing and reintroducing the child's body, its affect, and its mind to each other. The mother is always naming the child's feelings, telling the child why it's feeling upset, going back and forth between the mind and the body. Winnicott has a wonderful image for what happens when this 
occurs in a normal way. He says two things happen, indwelling and personalization. For indwelling, he means something that we know as the imperishable personal spirit of the individual comes down and dwells in this person, takes up residence for the first time. Personalization, he means simply, this is how we get a personality. This is the beginning of personhood. The true self has a life which is possible to be lived in the intermediate space between the inner world and outer reality. And it's constantly being introduced through the mother's empathy. Now, in a case such as our little girl, um, something uh, about indwelling and personalization is interrupted. The, the baby's normal relaxed experience of being turns into dangerous disintegration anxiety. Indwelling does not occur. Depersonalization results. This is a shattering which Jung did not even contemplate because it occurs before primal ego integration has taken place, before an entity has emerged that could be shattered. <clears throat> so our little girl then is in critical danger. Now flooded with pain and unspeakable anxiety, she faces the potential annihilation of her very personhood, the destruction of her personal spirit. This would be equivalent to soul murder, as Leonard Chengold talked about it. This catastrophic possibility must be avoided at all costs, and so something quite extraordinary happens. Psychoanalysis's way of saying what happens is that primitive unconscious defenses come to the little girl's rescue and dissociate her psyche. Suddenly, she is on the ceiling, looking down at what is happening to her numb body, which she has vacated. This is the way dissociation works. If you're in an unbearable situation and you're helpless to leave, then a part of you leaves. And for this to happen, the whole self must be split in two in order to prevent the unthinkable anxiety from being fully experienced. This is the way we understand this now. So what happens to these two parts of the self? One part regresses back to the stage of relative innocence before the trauma, and one part of her progresses, grows up too fast. This progressed part usually identifies with the persecutor. We call this identification with the aggressor. Ferenzi says the child vacates its body, takes up an identification with the only lovable object present, which is the father or the abusing person, and takes up that person's attitude towards its own neediness and its own vulnerability. So you can see how the split happens. Frenzy then further says, the child then interjects the perpetrator. So what gets sets up, set up in the inner world then is a, is a bivalent two-person structure in which there's an innocent child who has retreated into an inner sanctum, protected but also persecuted by a progressed self which Ferenzi thought of as the interjected parental imago, but which from a Jungian standpoint, we, we have reason to think is much more than that. And that's one of the things I'll be talking about shortly. The progressed self in this structure, which I call the trauma complex or the self-care system in my book, does not always hate the regressed self. Frequently, we see a kind of life-saving love for the inner child inside the encapsulated system that I'm describing. In these cases, the progressed self is a kind of caretaker who watches out for the regressed self like a mother bear looking after her vulnerable cub. We'll see another example of this caretaker self in Rapunzel's witch, who when she steals the baby, says to the terrified father, I will treat it like a mother, and indeed does. Everything is fine 
until this innocent child wants to have a life outside the witch's uh, control. And then a whole other side of the caretaker self erupts, which I'm, I'm giving away the fairy tale, but uh, just to give you a little preview. Okay, I think that's enough about this structure. Now, one of the things I want to say about this structure is that um, the rescue that is affected by these figures in the unconscious is truly miraculous. And this is one of the places where I did get excited from a Jungian standpoint because it, this was not recognized. Jung doesn't talk much about defenses, uh, partly because he was alienated from Freud and Freud only talked about ego defenses. The defenses that we're talking about tonight get organized on a far earlier, more primitive level of the psyche. They're, they're defenses of the self, the Jungian self. They're organized by far bigger realities in the collective psyche, and therefore they're archetypal defenses. And they have extraordinary wisdom. Here's one of Jung's comments. I just found this before I came down here to give this talk. I had never uh, read this, this passage. And this is one of the wonderful things about spe speaking to people like yourselves is that you, you start going through the literature to try to elaborate it a little bit and you come upon something that you always thought but never was articulated. And of course it's Jung that's doing the articulating here. This is in his Secret of the Golden Flower, his commentary on that. He says, our time has committed a fatal error. We believe we can criticize the facts of religion intellectually. We completely forget that the reason mankind believes in the daimon has nothing whatever to do with external factors, but is simply due to a naive awareness of the tremendous inner effect of the autonomous fragmentary systems. Western man should learn to acknowledge these psychic forces anew. His dissociative tendencies are actual psychic personalities possessing a differential reality. They are higher, invisible, and spiritual beings. So, I mean, what Jung is really saying here is he's introducing this, this term daimonic, which I'll be using tonight, it's from the Greek D-A-I or D-A-E-M-O-N. Um, and the daimons were very, very uh, popular with the Greeks. Eros, the mighty daimon, was, was understood to be one of these intermediate spirits. Daimons are halfway between gods and humans. Socrates um, says that um, because humans cannot have direct intercourse with the gods, a whole intermediate world of beings had to be created. So that uh, they, the daimons then fly upwards with our prayers of intercession and come down to deliver messages from, from the gods. They also go the other way into Hades, so that daimonic reality is both angels and demons. I don't know whether any of you have read Philip Pullman but uh, Philip Pullman is all about uh, the fact that, that each child is born, uh, this is basic Jungian psychology, it's, it's, uh, it's Plotinus, it's James Hillman, it's Jung. Um, the, uh, each child has its own daimon, which is an animal, and it can change shape in Philip Pullman's wonderful trilogy until the child reaches adolescence and then it becomes fixed. And, I don't know why I'm plugging Philip Pullman tonight, but if you should really read this. It's, a, it's an amazing, uh, it would be really fun to do a Jungian analysis of this trilogy because what, they, what the evil forces in the book have discovered is that if you separate a child from its daimon, you liberate energy that opens up other worlds. And so the second book is called The Subtle Knife. Uh, no, actually The Subtle Knife isn't the knife that carves the child away from its daimon. That's another worse thing. It's like a, a guillotine. But you get the idea. Uh, daimonic reality is what Jung is talking about here. It's intermediate between uh, the archetypal and the human. <clears throat> now, 
the reason this is important is to link it to what I've already told you is that what we find in the unconscious and what we find confirmed in fairy tales is that what I've called the progressed self seems to have access to higher powers in the psyche, transpersonal or archetypal powers that make it a feared reality. This protective persecutory progressed self can cast spells. It can put the ego in a trance. It's the agency in the psyche that hypnotizes the ego. It can dissociate the ego from feeling or from memory that is unbearable. It can provide intrapsychic soothing. Sometimes it bathes the ego in the positive side of the numinosum, in states of bliss or oblivion. Sometimes in order to protect the vulnerable regressed self from possible further trauma, it seduces the ego into states of addiction, to substances, to food or alcohol. It's often the voice behind these addictions. In other words, the progressed self is an archetypal defense with a daimonic power. Now, um, I'm going to skip ahead here a little bit. We can come back to some of this in the question. <clears throat> Let me give you an example um, from clinical practice. This is the first dream of a 48-year-old woman who has just begun her analysis. She was depressed for no apparent reason, at least that's the way it seemed to her. She had had all the advantages, she said, of an upper middle class upbringing. She lived in a beautiful home. Her children were all well adjusted and grown up, above average in Lake Wobegon language. <laughs> she had a decent marriage, not especially intimate, but good enough, she said, so it felt crazy and Quite frankly, she said, self-indulgent to be consulting a therapist. All she could tell me about this depression that she alluded to was that as far back into her childhood as she could remember, she had felt that there was something terribly wrong with her. She had felt somehow defiled, bad, unlovable. As the years went by, the thought began to haunt her that she wasn't really living her own life. She didn't feel real, somehow. She didn't have any energy or any creative energy. And she said, I don't think I ever really was happy. So as we started exploring her early history, she brought the following dream. I'm shopping in Katona which is where I practice. It's a little town in Westchester County, north of New York. And my attention is drawn across the street to a new pet store in town where the old hardware store used to be. I look in the window and I see puppies playing in a bed of torn up newspapers. They're so cute, I can't avoid going in. As I look down the aisle into the various cages, I suddenly come to a cage which shocks and horrifies me and sends chills up my spine. There's a baby in one of the cages. I'm horrified. The baby's eyes are glazed over and it's staring into space. Otherwise it looks okay, maybe 18 months old. I confront one of the men in the store. What is going on here, I shout. What are you doing with a baby in the cage? The man backs up and folds his arms and smiles at me, a weird demonic smile like Jack Nicholson in The Shining. <laughs> he says nothing. I start to get really panicked and begin backing out of the store. Something dark and terrible is going on in this place. I'm so terrified that I wake up with my heart pounding. Now this dream shocked the patient and surprised me, um, but it is a dream typical of dreams that sometimes people have early on in the therapy process, which really gives us a picture of the inner world and the trauma complex that I'm describing. The baby in the example that I've given represents her early true self potential, we could say. Her tra traumatized innocent selfhood may be revived because her analysis is beginning and she's starting to hope that someone will notice this side of herself. 
This encounter comes in a pet store where the old hardware store used to be. What do you make of that? I, I don't know. I mean, these, these images and dreams never have a clear interpretation, but what I thought was, well, you know, something is softening here. Where the old hardware store used to be, where they sell tools and mechanical devices, it's now full of new life puppies and, and, and God forbid, this baby is discovered there. The Jack Nicholson character represents what I've been talking about as the progressed self, and his grin identifies him as daimonic. He seemed immediately to my patient to be an evil figure. He seemed to have put the baby in an altered state, or maybe drugged the child, she thought, in the dream, further identifying him with these addictive hypnotic and spellcasting powers. Now, um, as, as the therapy went on with this woman, who I'll call Helen, um, after a period of time, we started to uncover some of what may have put that baby in the cage. It was never luminously clear in her analysis, but um, let me give you the kind of experience that she had, which happened many times in her childhood. She was four years old. The whole family was gathered in great excitement on the front lawn of a beautiful new home that they were moving into. The moving van was there and great excit excitement pervaded the scene. Mommy and Daddy were there and she was there and the neighbors were out to greet them. And it was a wonderful moment full of excitement and hope. And the little girl that was later my patient, at four years old, ran down and picked a bouquet of flowers and brought them up and presented them to her mother. And the mother looked at the little girl and looked at the flowers and looked where she had picked them. And she said, you pick those flowers from the neighbor's garden. Now you get back to that neighbor and apologize. And she dragged the little girl over to the neighbor Obviously, this is a very anxious mother, concerned about making an impression in a new neighborhood, and forced her to apologize. Now, we've all had experiences like that. Um, occasional moments like this in an otherwise affirmative childhood are not going to matter all that much. They'll be absorbed. But if this kind of moment is repeated and accumulates, then you have what Masud Khan called cumulative trauma. It mounts up. With repeated shaming incidents like this, it didn't take Helen very long to develop an eating disorder and to start wishing she were a boy. By the time she got to me in therapy, she had become a very self-sufficient, successful professional woman. But inwardly, she was possessed by a demonic defense that echoed the mother's words, no, no, Helen. That's bad. What's the matter with you? This voice was no longer an episodic chastisement. It was now somehow deep in her bones as a kind of basic assumption about existence. She felt a profound sense of her own defilement, her own inherent badness, her lack of entitlement to be. This is what Sandra Edelman in her recent book called Turning the Gorgon uh, published by Spring Publications, has called ontological shame. It's, it's like being, being shamed for your very life. Uh, I recommend her book uh, to you. Um, even today, when Helen does something that humiliates herself or brings shame to herself, for example, she forgets a person's name or she does something silly, she will hear the voice in herself, I hate you, I hate you. I hate you. So you can feel the, you can hear that, that, that I would describe that voice as the progressed self that hates what the needy, innocent, reaching out self has just done because it's gotten it into trouble with the collective. All right? Now, uh, let me give you another example. A mother sent her little girl, this is an example of the positive side of the daimonic defense. A mother sent her little girl 
with an important message to take to her father, um, who was in his study reading. It was just before dinner. The little girl was about five. Her daughter came back and said, Mommy, with tears in her eyes, and said, Mommy, the angel won't let me go in. Whereupon the mother uh, said, humoring her, well, now you just tell the angel that your mommy says that you have to deliver this message. And so you tell the angel to get out of the way. And the little girl went back, came back again to the mother, this time more tears. Mommy, I can't, can't. So the mother walked the little girl, by now sort of impatient with her imaginative excess, um, walked the little girl into the study and there, pausing on the threshold, saw through the doorway that her husband was dead in his chair, his drink having fallen out of his hand. Okay, now these, to use the phrase of Winnicott, you wouldn't ask that little girl, did you make that angel up or did you find the angel? Because this is daimonic reality. This is the way the psyche comes to the rescue of the imperishable personal spirit that cannot metabolize what it's confronted with. We don't know the history of that story or the sequelae of that, of that event. If the mother um, was there for the little girl's anxiety and helped her grieve the loss of the father and metabolize that and perhaps um, helped with play therapy and all manner of other things that would help the little girl express her feelings, then the angel wouldn't have needed to stick around. The angel could have gone back into the unconscious. But if the mother abandoned her little girl emotionally at this time, which we can easily imagine might happen, perhaps she's overwhelmed herself, and in the weeks and months that follow, and other things happen, then the angel will have to take up its role of dissociating this little girl's personality. And it will do this in the way I've described. It will help split her up into an innocent younger person who can live a life inside an encapsulated place in her unconscious. And it will guard and protect the perimeter of that encapsulated place. So with that in mind, let's start into our story, if we can. In the first part of our fairy tale, we're introduced to a man and his wife who live high up above a splendid walled garden. And down in the garden are many beautiful flowers and herbs that the wife of this couple starts to crave. The couple is childless, we're told, and this has gone on for a long time. But the wife is starting to have strange cravings for a certain plant, uh, vegetable, in the garden called Rampion or Rapunzel. She looks out her little window at the green Rapunzel growing below and she pines away for it. And her poor husband, who wants to get her some from the garden, but realizes that he can't because the garden is occupied and has inside it an old enchantress, an old witch, with power feared in all the land. But the wife's longing increases until finally the poor husband decides he has to risk it and so he goes down at twilight and steals a bunch of the Rapunzel and brings it back to the wife. And she eats it greedily and gobbles it up and makes several salads of it and, and is finally has her craving sat, uh, satisfied. Strangely enough, she's also pregnant now. Uh, and the baby that's to be born is the same name as the plant, that, the vegetable that she had this terrible craving for. But the craving doesn't end, and so the husband, uh, quite dis desperate now, has to uh, descend again into the garden, and, but this time the old witch catches him and says, how dare you steal my Rapunzel like a thief? He pleads his case, desperate to get away. She agrees, she takes certain pity on him and says, all right, 
um, I'll let you have as much Rapunzel as you, as you want, and I'll let you go and take it to your wife. But you must give me the baby that your wife will deliver. So the husband in his terror consents to everything, and the deal is struck. Well, now let's imagine that we have here a picture of just what I've been describing, the trauma defense, okay? First of all, the structure of the world is consistent. There's a division between two worlds, separated by a high wall, which the husband has to go over. <clears throat> we'll find that this division repeats in the tale because later it becomes the walled tower in which Rapunzel is trapped and kept. But the structural uh, realities of the tale defining these two worlds are interesting. What would we say about them? Well, we might imagine that the green growing world down in this wet um, lush garden is sort of like the creative unconscious, right? The creative imagination. That would be supported by the fact that it's got an enchantress, a sorceress inside it. So it's not just the personal unconscious, it's got a collective figure at the center of it. Then the other world, high up, uh, above the garden, separated from the garden, with no way down, uh, is the sort of mundane world of unredeemed reality. And this place is, uh, well, one of the interesting features of it is that the wife is barren. So the structure in that tale is very much like the structure we find in the, in the psyches of people who have suffered early trauma. One part, the progressed part, has grown up too fast. Um, perhaps the person is very, very capable in work settings, in academic settings, in external settings. Um, perhaps the person has a brilliant mind, is self-sufficient, is autonomous, maybe is a tremendous success. But inside somewhere, there's a walled garden. And the guardian of that garden is a demonic figure. Um, now, the reason that we're talking about this in structural terms is that the world of reality, which we all have to get to out of our childhood omnipotence and grandiosity and the magical world, is one world. And the other world is the world we start in. And it's a world of incredible creative potentialities and incredible magical powers. But the transitional process of how we get from omnipotence and grandiosity and uh, inflation, identification with the unconscious, to the world of reality is a tricky business. Uh, and most of the depth psychologists who talk about this have to confront that problem. Winnicott is one of the major ones. He calls the way this happens transitional relatedness. And he says, here's what happens. The baby is hungry and hallucinates the breast. The mother in her empathy puts her breast exactly at the place of that hallucination. At that moment, a magical connection is made and the baby has an experience of creating the world with his own imagination. Um, if good enough experiences happen like that, then the, the world of outer reality and the world of the inner potentiality of the unconscious stay linked and the person grows up with a healthy ego, flexible ego. If trauma intervenes, those two worlds are split and that's the problem that we're looking at. Now in our story, the dissociated condition of the wall in between these two worlds um, is the beginning of the structure, but the story proposes a solution. And the solution is a st And, you know, in, in fairy tales, we often see this. Um, one part of the whole psyche is trapped in enchantment. Remember the baby in the pet store. Its eyes are glazed over. It's in an altered state. There's a, there's a figure who's guarding it. So the child, in many of these stories, represents the potential for realization of the personal spirit in incarnate life. 
I remember a woman I had in therapy who um, was trying desperately to have a child said to me once, having a baby is about having a life life rooted in real things. And what she meant was exactly what I'm saying here, is that the, the child which comes from the mysterious world of, of the unknown into this world frequently arrives carrying that symbolic meaning. Um, many times in psychotherapy people have images of babies and children and dreams, the divine child even, um, and they mistake that for a, a, a literal concrete desire to have a child. Sometimes it is that. Sometimes that is the direction their life follows. But oftentimes the image of the child uh, is such a powerful carrier for, for life's potential, for this link between the God's world and the human world. And I think that it's for that reason that almost all the great religions, uh, when they answer the question, does God manifest in history? Does God come down into this world? It always is a child. It's the child in Bethlehem, or it's the child Buddha uh, born under the bow tree. It's always that, that miraculous child who is both heavenly and human that carries that link. Um, <clears throat> Another interesting fact that we might think about is that the witch in our story is in the same plight as the mother, childless. She lives in an enchanted world, walled off from reality, growing Rapunzel, seemingly quite content, until the husband breaks in from out there. And so the husband is a kind of catalyst for the witch and her awareness that she too is missing something. It's almost as if the world of enchantment needs the world of the ego in order to realize itself. Now she wants something real. She wants a real child, something she can't have because she's a witch. Only a human mother can bear a child. So both the mother and the witch end up wanting what the other has on her side of the wall, and envy and longing seem to be an important link here. Now in the second part of our story, the old witch comes for the baby as soon as it's delivered, takes it away, and locks it in a tower in the forest. And there's no way in or out of this tower, except each day the old witch brings food, and each day she stands beneath the tower and cries, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair to me. Actually, to be perfectly fair to the story, she doesn't lock Rapunzel in the tower until she's 12 years old, like just prior to sexuality, right? So all this hair is developed, right? And Rapunzel, who has the most beautiful hair, long and fine as spun gold, lowers her braids to the old witch, hooks them around a hook next to the window, and the old witch climbs up with the food for Rapunzel. And this goes on for many years. So here we have an image of the trauma defense organized now in our fairy tale. Rapunzel, the innocent child, inside the enclosure with her witch as guardian. Most traumatized people have made this kind of pact with their own private devil. They don't know they've made that pact, but they've made an arrangement. The daimonic caretaker says, you can have a life in this world you can lead a life as a false self. Maybe not even as a false self. You can develop all your capacities, but you have to give the baby to me. You can't risk that vulnerability in this life. You can't show that vulnerability to um, anybody else. Never again will you expose this little one to the kind of trauma that you, went, uh, that you underwent before. You sort of see the direction I'm, I'm going with that. It's, it's the, pe the people with severe early trauma are often very highly successful people in the outer world, and when they frequently come into therapy, and this, mind you, is not something that's unique to just people that have suffered abuse, but trauma is a part of all of our lives. 
But when they come into therapy is, is when they get into an intimate relationship and they need to be able to access vulnerable feelings and they can't. They can't let anybody close to them. Or um, they become too frightened or they split off or rage erupts or whatever. Um, <clears throat> now, in mythology, this kind of structure is frequently represented with one part of the self getting trapped in the underworld. You remember the myth of Eurydice or Persephone in Hades, guarded by another part which is both protective and persecutory. You remember how Persephone, Demeter's daughter, is abducted by Hades and imprisoned with him um, in, the, in, in the bowels of hell itself. Always when this happens, a problem develops in the upper world where everything freezes up and nothing grows. The world becomes a wasteland because the connecting links between these two worlds has been severed. And if this goes on for too long, a crisis develops and something desperate must be done. In the Demeter Persephone story, as you all remember, um, finally um, Hermes Mercurius works out a deal. Um, he goes down into Hades and Persephone is allowed to come back into the upper world uh, six months of the year and then she has to go back into into Hades and that's when we have springtime. One other thing we can do to understand this part of our story a little bit is to amplify the image of the witch and I'm going to tell you a little lore about witches here. We find that universally witches are spellcasters they're associated with the night world, with death. They personify altered states of consciousness. Frequently they have the power of prophecy. They sometimes devour children. They're always stealing children. And they do not weep. The insensitivity of witches is part of how they're recognized. If a witch is stuck with a pin, she doesn't feel it. This was actually used in, in some of the Salem witch trials. In fact, any insensitive part of the body, like a scar, is called a witch's mark or a devil's mark. So witches are associated with psychic numbness and inability to feel pain. They might be understood then to represent the psyche's ability to anesthetize itself, to dissociate, freeze, or hypnotize the personality from within. The witch personifies this defense. And as I said before, the witch is not all bad. She takes care of Rapunzel like a mother. And the story tells us that Rapunzel grows into the most beautiful child under the sun. A charming voice, she sings like a bird, has beautiful blonde hair, as fine as spun gold. She's a kind of princess, a poella eternus, beautiful, innocent, captivating, but sealed in a bubble. Now, in order to keep her in her tower, Rapunzel's witch must keep her from wanting anything in the outside world, and so there's no way in or out. Also, the voice of the witch is the voice of negativity in the psyche of the trauma victim. Rapunzel patients are usually very familiar with her voice. The witch is the one that says, it doesn't matter. Don't stick your neck out. You don't really want it anyway. You'll just be disappointed. Or if perhaps the person finds the courage to take a risk and has suffered humiliation, as the case of my patient Helen, she's the one who says, I told you so. I hate you. In psychoanalytic theory, we would identify the witch in our fairy tale with the traumatized person's resistance to change. The trauma survivor finds it very difficult to trust a real person with feelings of dependency and neediness because these very feelings have been brutally abused and abandoned. The self-sufficient, tough, counter-dependent witch mother holds the vulnerable, innocent Rapunzel inside as a shameful secret. And to let her feel attached to someone in the outside is extremely dangerous as far as the witch is concerned. The outer world has proven totally unreliable unreliable, traumatic, and dangerous. So the trauma patient with her tough counter-dependent facade becomes intolerant of her own neediness and immaturity.
Now, <clears throat> part three. In the next part of our story, actually this is the final part, um, the king's son comes riding through the forest and hears the beautiful sweet voice of Rapunzel singing like a bird from her high tower. He's overcome with longing, another theme that we've encountered before, right? For what's inside, all that beauty and innocence. He wants to climb up to her, but he can't find a door, so he leaves in confusion only to come back the next day. So deeply has his heart been touched. And then the next day, as he's standing behind a tree, he sees the old enchantress come and sees how she gets in. And he thinks to himself, I'll try that too. So later that evening, when the witch has departed, the prince goes underneath the tower and says, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. Immediately the hair falls down and the young sing, king's son climbed up. The Brothers Grimm tells us, at first Rapunzel was terribly frightened when a man such as her eyes had never yet beheld came to her. But the king's son began to talk to her quite like a friend and told her that his heart had been so stirred that it had let him have no rest and he had just been forced to see her. Then Rapunzel lost her fear. And when he asked her if she would take him for her husband and she saw that he was young and handsome, she thought, he will love me more than the old witch does. And she said yes, and she laid her hand in his. She said, I will willingly go away with you, but I do not know how to get down. Bring with you a skein of silk every time you come, and I will weave a ladder with it. And when that is ready, I will descend, and you will take me on your horse. They agreed that until that time, he should come to her every evening, for the old woman came by day. There's a fourth part after this. But I want to talk now in this connection about some treatment implications. Um, because we have here um, this, the fairy tales answer to how do we link up these two worlds again. At least this is the first part of a two-part answer. Um, What about Rapunzel's hair? How would we interpret this? It serves as the way into the tower and the way out of the tower for both the prince and the sorceress at this stage in this fairy tale. Well, I like to think that Rapunzel's hair is a kind of image of her innocence and unconsciousness, like a head full of fantasies, which exist in a sort of uninitiated state the image suggests pure fantasy serves as the only link to reality at this early stage. Eventually, this hair ladder has to be replaced by a more realistic ladder. She says, I don't know how to get down, so bring a skein of silk each time and I will weave a ladder. I think this slow incremental process is like the psychotherapy process, step by step, skein by skein. And in order to make this analogy clear, um, I want to say uh, one more thing about this issue of transitional space, because it's the major thing that we try to help facilitate in the work with trauma people. And this particular piece of fancy jargon, which is really the missing piece that we need here, is called by Heinz Kohut, phase appropriate disillusionment. <laughs> It's a real mouthful. Kohut says that in good enough family environments, we all come through our childhoods by negotiating a difficult passage between the magical world of childhood, the archetypal and numinous world, to a point where we emerge with a solidly established reality ego cap capable of, of negotiating the adult world. Um, According to Kohat, in childhood, we need parental figures to idealize during this process. Heroes to emulate, people we love to receive our archetypal idealizations, and to help us metabolize our titanic, omnipotent feelings and aspirations. We need, in other words, a period of creative illusion, a time of creative merger between our imaginations and the world. 
Then slowly we can give up these illusions as reality becomes tolerable and we're included in the wider human community and culture. This, by the way, is always a sacrifice of the inflated, God-identified ego. But it's a sacrifice that's worth it because you get paid back in growing increments of consciousness. Normal children can usually give up their fantasies of Santa Claus because mom and dad have done a pretty good job matching the outer world of Christmas celebration with the child's deep inner fantasies. The wished for item appears in the stocking as if by magic. The whole thing is all engineered by a strange bearded fellow up in the North Pole and so forth. Usually when kids find out that this has all been an elaborate deceit, they're willing to join the older kids and the adults who know what's really going on. The exciting growth in consciousness and inclusion in adult life is worth the sacrifice of illusion. So ego development then itself becomes numinous. And when the literal fantasy collapses, the symbolic function is born and with it what Jung calls the transcendent function. But the child who's been traumatically disillusioned, such as when an idealized beloved parent abuses the child, then there's a loss of the slow phased disillusionment process and an unbearable reality breaks in too soon. This injures the symbolic process. Imaginative connections to the world are broken. Imagination turns into self-soothing bewitchment, disconnected from reality. The inner world then becomes a refuge and a defense against the anxiety of living. And what we know now is that when this happens, a kind of darkness inevitably takes over the inner world. Now psychotherapy is a powerful containing relationship. And because it's neutral and benign, it recreates a safe and empathic container usually in which the person who was traumatized as a child and is now an adult can once again find this link between the imaginal and the real. When the trauma patient enters therapy, there is often a deep positive connection that occurs early on between the Rapunzel part of the patient and the benign image of the therapist who may be perceived as a rescuing prince. This positive attachment, we call it transference, carries the hope for healing, but it also carries the danger of re-traumatization. The patient is being asked by the whole setup to trust the therapist, to give up the daimonic self-care system, the inner tower in which she has been safe and survived for years under the supervision of her witch-like mother. She's asked to give this up and depend on somebody in the outer world out there, somebody who might leave, somebody who might abandon, somebody who might die. And then there's this other reality that breaks in on these people with great force. The relationship is contractual. It's professional. It's not really a special friend. So it's a peculiar arrangement that's both in the world and not in the world. And it's actually set up like this by design. In our story, a magical rapport develops between Rapunzel and the prince a little at a time. Trust develops along with intimacy and hope. During this phase, Rapunzel's hair, the fantasy element, predominates and provides the major link between the world inside and outside the tower. In the therapy situation, this begins as the trauma patient begins to feel attached to the therapist, or shall we say that the imprisoned little girl in the patient begins to feel attached to the therapist's positive imago someone who seems to be kind and who seems to be reliable. <clears throat> the child in the patient's tower begins to, to elaborate fantasies around the treatment situation. And mind you, what I'm describing now is not something that happens in every case. Uh, I'm gonna take a paradigmatic story here and tell it to you uh, because it has enough features of of how this works, at least in certain cases where it really works well, 
um, that that it's familiar. But by no means is this the paradigm or the story for every person that has suffered trauma in relationship to a therapist. It's just a one of, of many versions. Fantasies are elaborated around the treatment situation and around the anonymity of the analyst's life and presence. A sense of renewed hope and love begins to emerge. At the same time, the rescuing prince in the therapist falls in love with the innocent abused child in the patient. And wants more than anything else to help her out of her inner isolation and into the world. This is the counter-transference. And with people who have suffered early trauma, in my experience, it is very strong. It can actually consume the therapist's life. If you want, I'll tell you stories about that in the break. <laughs> but then there is another world constellated by the psychoanalytic situation that is likely to undermine these sanguine developments. And this is the world of the psychoanalytic framework the world of the reality of what the two partners are there to do, the world of limitation and facticity and history. This harsh world of reality involves the fact that the analyst and patient have come together to work on the patient's difficulties. The fact that the analyst charges a fee for his work and offers his services in time-limited segments. The fact that the analyst rescuing empathy during the hour cannot be counted on between hours or in the middle of the night. This activates the witch in the patient's inner system, and the witch says, never again. Never again will you trust someone outside and be hurt like you were before. You belong to me. You need me. You're nothing without me. I got you through hell, and you can't betray me. Another way to say this is that for the patient, the analyst becomes both an object of deep imaginal desire and an object of feared re-traumatization. So the trauma situation, the therapy situation ironically repeats the original situation in which the patient was hurt, in which intimacy was both invited and then betrayed. For the analyst, the patient becomes both the beloved innocent child who he wants to rescue and protect, and also, to his horror, the child he is bound to disappoint. This puts him at odds with his own Hippocratic oath to do no harm, because he starts to realize that he's going to do harm. Hopefully, it will be the harm that heals. The key is that this time, the trauma in the transference and the countertransference can hopefully be phased in such a way that the therapeutic partners can slowly work through both love and hate, desire and betrayal, so that the inner world and the outer do not come apart in a cataclysm as they did originally. On an inner level, we hope that symbolic space holds, that there is enough rapport to hold things together, that the patient's affect tolerance grows, that the injury to love can be worked through. The story says the prince was deeply touched in his heart. He's enchanted by the inner Rapunzel, which is an altered state for the therapist also. The prince crawls into the tower on the long tresses of fantasy hair. In other words, for him, the world of reality is left behind also. The tower is, after all, a bewitched world of seductive energy, and both partners at this stage leave behind the harshness of traumatic reality, which has penetrated the patient's world too soon. This world is now restored in a magical connection between the protagonists. A mutual deception occurs, but a benign and necessary one. Mutual love and new life are all that matter. Both people forget what they're there to do. I'll tell you more about that later, too. Um, we notice, for example, in our story that Rapunzel and the prince are slightly dishonest with each other. Their meeting is sustained in illusion by a sort of necessary splitting off of each of the reality sides of, of each partner. Rapunzel appears to the prince as the lovely, innocent victim and colludes with him against the witch who remains her secret. She doesn't introduce him to this shadow side of her innocence, at least not yet. He will have to meet her later. 
Similarly, the prince tricks Rapunzel into thinking that he's identical with the good food-bringing side of the witch, the nourishing side, in order to get in. So he represents himself as nourishing and loving. He doesn't mention his reality limitations, his other responsibilities in the kingdom back home. What takes place then is a lot of powerful connecting energy, a healing transference illusion, we call it. And this brings with it a renewed link with the world that had previously been devoid of fantasy, unstoried and unredeemed. But this link will have to survive the test of the dark side, which is about to emerge. Part four. The enchantress remarked nothing of this until once Rapunzel said to her, tell me, old dame Gothel, how it, does it happen that you are so much heavier for me to draw up than the young king's son? He's with me in just a moment. <laughs> ah, you wicked child, it, the witch cried. What do I hear you say? I thought I had separated you from the whole world, and yet you have deceived me. In her anger, she clutched Rapunzel's beautiful tresses, wrapped them twice around her left hand, seized a pair of scissors, and snip, snap, they were cut off, and the lovely braids lay on the ground. And she was so pitiless that she took poor Rapunzel into the desert where she, where she was thrown out of the tower and had to live in great grief and misery. And on the same day that she cast out Rapunzel, she fastened the braids of her hair, which she had cut off, to the hook on the window. And when the king's son came, and cried, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. She let the hair down, and the young king's son ascended. But instead of finding his dearest Rapunzel, he found the enchantress, who glared at him with wicked and venomous looks. Aha, she cried, you would fetch your dearest, but the beautiful bird sits no longer singing in its nest. The cat has got it and will scratch out your eyes as well. Rapunzel is lost to you. You will never see her again. The king's son is beside himself with pain, and in his despair, he leaps down from the tower. His life is saved, but the thorns into which he falls pierce his eyes. He wanders quite blind about the forest, ate nothing but roots and berries, and did not but lament and weep over the loss of his dearest partner. Thus he roamed about in misery for some years, and at length came to the desert where Rapunzel with the twins, which she had given birth to, twins, boy and girl, lived in wretchedness. He heard a voice, and it seemed so familiar to him that he went toward it, and when he approached, Rapunzel knew him and fell on his neck and wept. Two of her tears wetted his eyes, and they grew clear again, and he could see with them as before. He led her to his kingdom, where he was joyfully received, and they lived for a long time afterwards, happily and contented. Now here we have the final part of our story and the final part of my remarks tonight, the, the denouement, what Jung would have called the crisis and lysis of the dream. We might call this part rupture in the symbiotic membrane, leading to what Melanie Klein called the depressive position. Here are the two worlds which have become merged in the mutuality of transference and countertransference illusion come apart with a stormy crash and terrible disappointment is the result. Paranoid and persecutory allegations are made. It's interesting how these two worlds come together through a slip of the tongue, which of course is Freud's discovery about how unconscious content that split off and not being represented comes into conscious, uh, intrudes itself into conscious awareness. So the split-off negativity hiding underneath the pleasing world of illusion and innocence comes crashing in, and the witch flies into a rage. Now again, this is only one form that this takes in the therapy situation. In therapy, moments like this usually occur when the trauma patient finds the courage to make actual claims on the therapist, that is, transferential demands which the therapist cannot possibly meet, even if he wants to. The therapist's honest limitations result in disillusionment, and the patient is understandably enraged and now has the capacity to say so. The analyst is also traumatized and horrified. All of his good princely rescue intentions suddenly seem to have done nothing but create a hideous illusion, a codependency with the patient's inner Rapunzel. 
Both parties suffer a disillusioning loss at this stage. The patient thought the therapist would really be the